Our loving Father in heaven, we come into your presence, dear God, because you have invited us to do that. You've told us to come boldly to the throne of grace, and that is what we're doing now. Father in heaven, grant to us what we cannot give to ourselves, and that is the gift of your Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of truth, and so we ask you, Father, to send him to direct our thinking that we may understand your word. Please, God, remember the promise you made to Moses in Exodus chapter 4, verse 12, when you said to him, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Father, for Christ's sake, Teach me what to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Last night, our subject was, it had two titles. One was, the United States has three presidents. The other one was, what? Who issued your passport? Yes. We learned last night that there are two invisible kingdoms in the world. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And this we learn from the very lips of Jesus Christ himself when he said in Matthew 12, 26, If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And then Jesus proceeded to say in verse 28 of Matthew 12, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So from the truthful lips of Jesus Christ, we learned that there is a kingdom of God and there is a kingdom of Satan. Where there's a kingdom, there must be subjects. There are people in the kingdom of Satan and there are people in the kingdom of God. The people in the kingdom of God are those who live their lives by the constitution of God's kingdom and that is his law. Those in the kingdom of Satan are those who live their lives by the constitution of Satan's kingdom, and that is self or me first. Of course, in the kingdom of Satan are those who do not know they're in that kingdom. And they're there because of the darkness and the blindness and the imprisonment of ignorance. So there are two kingdoms, there are two kinds of subjects, and there are two rulers. Jesus Christ is the prince of life. Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. Gabriel called him one of the chief princes in Daniel chapter 10. Satan is called by Christ in John 12, 31, the prince of this world. In John 14, 30, the prince of this world. And in John 16, 11, the prince of this world. We cannot see visibly these two kingdoms. But they do exist according to the Bible. There are many things we cannot see, but whose existence we do not question. No one can see gravity, but we see the effects of gravity. You have never seen energy, but you've seen the effects of energy. You have never seen electricity, but you see the effects of electricity. There is a kingdom of God, and there is a kingdom of Satan. Every person listening to me now, you are either in God's kingdom or in Satan's kingdom. There isn't a third. We discovered last night that when you are in Satan's kingdom, you cannot get up and leave. Now, when you're in God's kingdom, you may do that freely. And God cannot stop you. Because God's kingdom is a kingdom of freedom. You may come and go as you please. Now it is God's desire that you remain in his kingdom because his kingdom is a kingdom of life. Jesus said in John 10, 16, I am come that they might, 10, 10, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of life. The kingdom of Satan is the kingdom of death. Jesus also said of him in the same verse, John 10, 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Christ comes for the opposite reason. Now, why is it you cannot live the kingdom of Satan? Because Isaiah 14, verse 17 tells us that he does not open the house of his prisoners. That is why Jesus said in Matthew 14, 12, verse 29, Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. What Jesus Christ was saying, the miracle you saw me perform on that man who was blind and dumb, I, you saw me binding Satan, restricting him in order that I might release one of his captives. When you are under Satan's control, You cannot break free unless Jesus Christ 
breaks you free. And you've got to call him. And so Jesus came into the world to set captives free. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 42. We shall read verses 6 and 7. As we continue, no law, no life. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. We're, all, we're still reviewing last night's message, but I want to stress something tonight I did not really mention much last night. And it is in connection with the fact that when you're in Satan's kingdom, you cannot leave. Listen to what Isaiah said that the mission of Jesus Christ would be. This is a prophecy of Christ's mission hundreds of years before he actually came. Isaiah 42, reading verses 6 and 7. Before we read, let me tell you that the version from which I preach is the King James Version. An offer was made to me tonight to put the verses on the screen, and I decline, and I'll tell you why. I want you to hold a Bible in your hand and read the verses. When the verse is on the screen, you lose the ability to find the books of the Bible because there's no need to search. Are you listening to me? If you have a King James, bring it with you when you come. If you don't, well, the wording will be slightly different, but the sense, I think, will be the same. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Look at verse 7. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. The prophecy states that one of the missions of Jesus Christ would be to open blind eyes to bring prisoners out of the prison. Blindness and imprisonment are spiritually the same thing. Listen to Isaiah 61, reading verse 1. Another prophetic statement of what Jesus Christ would come to do. Isaiah 61, reading verse 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to whom? The meek. He hath sent me to bind up the what? Brokenhearted. To proclaim what? Liberty to whom? The captives. An opening of the prison to whom? Them that are bound. Jesus Christ came to initiate a jailbreak. Now listen to Jesus Christ as he personally announces his mission in his hometown of Nazareth in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. And he will quote directly from Isaiah 61 1 with minor variation in the wording but no change in the sense. Isaiah 61 reading verse 1 Jesus says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What does the next statement say? To Do what? Preach what? Deliverance to whom? The captives. Recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And so Jesus came and one of his missions was to release people from captivity. And the only captivity you and I can be in is the captivity of sin. Jesus Christ can break you from any addiction that's harassing your life tonight. I don't care what it is, and I don't mean to sound harsh. I just mean to sound very clear and direct. I don't care what your addiction is. Jesus Christ can break it. That's one of the reasons why he came. If it's smoking, Christ has the power. If it's alcohol, Christ has the power. It is a pornographic addiction, Jesus Christ has the power. It is a sexual addiction, Jesus Christ has the power. If you're addicted to beating your spouse, Jesus Christ has the power to release you. If it is your desire to be released. Now let's jump to tonight's message. No law, no life. Our theme is heart to heart. And as you come from night to night, you will understand why that is the theme. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We're now beginning our tonight's message formally. No law, no life. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. 
And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. God made light. Light falls into a classification of existence. Perhaps I should use simpler expression. There are several levels at which anything or anyone can exist. Let me explain what I mean. This is a microphone. Does it exist, yes or no? Yes. Is it human, yes or no? Does it feel pain, yes or no? So it is in a category of existence that is non-living, so it is called inanimate. Now, light is inanimate, but it exists. Are you with me? Let's go to verse 11 of Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass. Now, is grass the same as this microphone, yes or no? No. Does grass live? Yes. But does grass feel pain as far as we know? No. So while grass is in the classification of a living thing, it is not really a living thing the way an animal is. Where I'm staying, I was just walking on the grounds, breathing some fresh air, such as it is in Southern California. And um, I was walking down the lane, and I saw a black cat. I love cats. And so the cat meowed, and I meowed right back. <laughs> and so he came from his yard. He actually did. And perhaps he belonged to my friends where I'm staying. But he came around the fence and came where I was. And he started rubbing against my leg. I patted him on the head. And he clearly liked it. He began to purr with great delight. And so I walked back up the lane, sat on the steps. He sat at my feet and I patted him. And he purred and he rubbed on my feet. And he slightly bit my finger. And um, then I had to go back to my room to re resume my reflection and my preparation for tonight. But... That cat enjoyed affection. Are you with me? But the cat is not a human being. Let's look at animals and the creation. Genesis 1, reading from verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So God created living things on the day five, and also on day six, reading from verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Now the beast of the earth, the cattle, the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, the creatures of the sea, they feel, they live, they eat, they reproduce. They're alive at a higher level than plants. So we have non-living things like light, like the firmament. We have living things like grass and trees. Then we have a higher level of living things like the animals that we keep as pets and the wild ones that we see in zoos. Then in verse 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. I want you to follow me very closely tonight as we proceed with no law, no life. There is something common to everything that God has created. There's something common. It is common to this microphone. Well, he didn't make the microphone, but he made the metal from which the microphone is made. This desk feels nothing, but it came from a tree. Everything that exists was made by God except sin. Somebody say amen. amen. That's ours by right. Whether it's non-living as a stone, or it has a basic form of life as a tree, or a higher form of life as an animal that reproduces and, and needs energy to get from one place to the next, or the highest form of created life on earth, that is human beings, everything created behaves. That's why my original title was Behave Yourself. But I prefer no law, no life. Listen to me again. Someone must have missed what I just said. Don't talk to anyone. You'll distract the person and yourself. Everything God has created 
behaves. The universe is made up of what? Give me one word. Matter. As Santa said, matter. All matter behaves. Let me explain. Does water behave the same way as a liquid, yes, uh, as a solid, yes or no? No. Come on. The, 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 yes, the, the answer was weak. Do solids and liquids behave the same way, yes or no? No. They behave differently. Do solids and gases behave the same way? No. Do gases and liquids behave the same way in every respect? No. The universe is made up of matter. We know matter exists as solid, liquid, and gas. Now, some smart person may say plasma. But it, let's say gas. It's an ionized gas, I believe. So, solid, liquids, gas. Follow me closely. No law, no life. Are there laws that govern the way gases behave? Yes. If that weren't the case, you couldn't transfer oxygen from your alveoli to your bloodstream. All doctors say amen. <laughs> Are there laws that govern the way liquids behave? Yes. Are there laws that govern the way solids behave? Yes. Now, if the universe, the cosmos, is made up of solids, liquids, Gases or matter, and all matter behaves, and that behavior is directed by law. Which means that the entire universe is run by law. This, uh, this floor is non living. You know why I'm not sinking through the floor? Physicists, you can answer me. Why am I not sinking through the floor? Because, the, you see, am I exerting pressure on this floor, yes or no? Yes, 210 pounds of pressure on this floor. Is that too much? Do I need to do more aerobics? <laughs> 210 pounds of pressure on the floor. Now, why am I not sinking through the floor? Because the floor is doing what? Returning a force. Don't ask me how. You know, there's a place in the Bible for don't ask me how. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And I, well, I don't need to finish. No one knows how it happens, the new birth. So don't ask me how. But if you don't believe me, go punch that wall. And you will come away doing this. Why? Because the wall returns what? A force equal to yours. That is a physical law. Now, everything God has created, solid, liquids, gases, they behave. And there are laws that govern their behavior. The same thing applies to human beings at a physical level. But before I delve into that, let me remind you of what you already know. When God made the light, listen to what he said. And God said, let there be light. He did not say, let us make light in our image. So while light must behave, light is not called upon to behave how? Like God. Are you with me? Let me say it again. Light is not required to behave like God or like Satan. Light is not a moral entity. When God made the trees, the grass, Genesis 1, 11 to 13, trees are not required to conduct themselves morally. Now, they do carry out photosynthesis, green living things. They do that using the sun and whatever else, carbon dioxide, and the byproduct is oxygen. They do that. But that is not a moral behavior. If that's clear, somebody say amen. amen. Preachers need reassurance that they're being followed. 
Let's move one step higher, the animals. Animals are not moral beings. They function by instinct and chemicals. If you put the right chemical on that piano stool, a dog will assume that piano stool is his wife. Are you listening to me? Because of a chemical command. Instinct. Chemicals. Now, when God made man, Genesis 1.26, the Bible says, and God said, let us make man how? In our image. Now, we have something different from the non-living, which is stones and wood, the living at a basic level, trees, living at a higher level, animals, now, living at the highest level of created existence on the earth, human beings. But let's, not, let's leave out the in our image part. Let's just take, let us make man. We are also physical. When the temperature drops and you step outside, what does the blood in your body do? When it's cold. Does it move to the surface to warm you up? Does it move somewhere? Yes. When you cut your finger, there's a process that stops the bleeding. What's that called? Coagulation. Do you control that process? Do you decide, do you tell your body, don't coagulate? There are laws at work because you and I are physical beings. If you break your arm and it is not properly set, it will set itself. The byproduct may not look like an arm, but it will set itself. Are you listening to me? There are laws at work because you and I, leaving out the in his image part, are physical beings and we are under the control of physical laws. But God said, let us make man in our image. Now, I said solids, liquids, and gases, they behave. And their behavior is controlled by law. Now, human beings are also physical, and there are laws that govern our behavior, but we are also moral. Made in the image of God, which cannot be said of the animals, cannot be said of the trees, cannot be said of the rocks and the stars. They were not made in God's image, even though they reflect his glory. They show his genius, his love for design, order, beauty, color, shape, symmetry. But we were made in his image. Now, behavior. The behavior of a dog does not come from its higher faculties. The behavior of a tree does not come from its mind. The behavior of a solid does not come from its conscience. It just Behaves with no choice in the matter. The behavior of a human being comes from an area that is entirely non-physical, non-liquid, non-gaseous. Have I lost anyone? Listen to me carefully. The behavior of a human being does not come from a physical source, a liquid source, or gaseous source. Therefore, there must be a law that governs it different from the laws that governs the way solids, liquids, and gases behave. Are you with me? That law is the Ten Commandments. Because all behavior must be governed by law. And since the human behavior originates from a non-physical, non-gaseous, non-liquid source, there must be a law that functions at that non-liquid, non-gaseous, non-solid source. So that the behavior that issues from it is a behavior under the control of law. That law, the Ten Commandments. Because God judges human behavior not from the arm or the leg or the elbow. He judges it 
from the source of the behavior that is the heart. And so Jesus tells us everything proceeds from the heart. Not the physical heart that pumps blood. He means the mind which is not solid, liquid, nor gas, but it exists. And the law that governs that in order to produce the correct behavior that reflects the image of God, that law, the Ten Commandments, not the law of gravity, not the law of electromagnetism, not the laws that govern for the synthesis, but the laws that allow a living human being made in the image of God to reflect the image of God. Can someone say amen? Now you take away law and solids cannot exist. Take away law and liquids cannot exist. Take away law and gases cannot exist. What am I saying? Where there is no law, finish it for me, there is no life, no existence. Let me say it again. There's a difference between existence and life. Existence means I'm here. Life means I'm alive. I'm breathing, living, reproducing. Life and existence depend upon law. Listen to the pen of inspiration. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 2. Listen to these words. They have a seismic effect on you. God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. Now those words are very carefully chosen. She does not say as an indispensable condition of his life. No, of his very existence. Even if he exists as a corpse. To exist, you must be under what? Law. Law is the basis of life. Law is the basis of existence. Let me repeat, at the risk of irritating you, no law, no life. No law, no existence. There is a power called Satan who is opposed to law. Which means he's opposed to what? Life. Don't be angry with me. I'm not sure you're following me. And I'll leave this place very pained in my heart if I speak for 45 minutes and no one followed what I said. Of course, it'll be my fault. There is a power called Satan that is opposed to law. Therefore, he's opposed to life, whether he's aware of it or not. Satan has gotten into the hearts of preachers to get them to preach from pulpits using Bible verses that there is what? No law. Now here's a preacher, a living man or woman, under physical law. Breathing because there are physical laws that govern that. Eyes working because there are laws that govern the, 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 the complex workings of the eye. And saying there's no law. That's the extent to which Satan has craftily manipulated the thinking of the world so that living people say there's no life. The tragedy is not only that that is preached. Perhaps the greater tragedy is, is that it is believed. The Bible tells us repeatedly, there will be a judgment. Are you thinking, what is a judgment? When you pass judgment, what are you doing? You're deciding that something is right or wrong. How can God judge you if he does not have a standard by which to judge? Are you listening to me? 
The Bible says in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Now the Bible says Satan sinned from the beginning. He sinned. Now that beginning is way before the world was made. How did God determine that Satan had sinned? He violated law. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, the angels that followed Satan, they sinned. How was the determination made that they had sinned? They violated law. Romans 3.23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's the violation of law. My beloved friends, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you take away the law, you know what collapses? Not only life, the gospel. Let me say it again differently. Why did Jesus come? What's the purpose of the gospel? The angel told Joseph in Matthew 121, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, what? Jesus, why? For he shall save his people from what? Their sins. There is only one thing from which God saves you. That is sin. You know, there's some people who believe Jesus came to die because of poverty. And so many preachers preach prosperity. They tell you, sow a seed. In their pockets. And you'll get rich. Which never happens. Wherever you go you turn the television on. You listen to the sermon. It is directed towards getting money. Out of the congregation. The subtle message is. Poverty. Is the reason why. Jesus came to die. If poverty were sin. You know who the biggest sinner would be? Jesus. Do you know how poor he was? Christ did not come to die because people had no degrees from Loma Linda. A lack of education is not a sin. I'm not saying it's a glorious thing. I am saying it is not a sin. Jesus Christ did not come to die because you did not have formal education. Christ came to die for one reason. Tell me what that reason is. Sin. Christ is a savior for one reason, sin. The purpose of the gospel is to reverse what sin did to God's creation. And so Jesus told Nicodemus in Luke 19.10, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Understand me clearly, well not me, understand God's word. You have one problem. Name it, sin. Now that problem has various expressions. Pride, stinginess, short temper, laziness, always late for church. (laughs) These are expressions of the one single condition, sin. Now, I said take away the law, you take away the gospel. Ella White writes, education, page 15, paragraph 2. Listen carefully. To restore in man the image of his maker. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was created. To promote the development of body, mind, and spirit that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. To bring him back from sin to what it was like before sin. What is sin? Transgression of the law. The purpose of the gospel is to undo the damage caused by violation of God's law. If you go to the doctor complaining of chest pains, 
and he tells you put a bandit on your big toe, you may look at him twice or her because that's not the problem, you see. Doctor, I have a pain in my left arm. He treats your right. The gospel is God's treatment for the violation of the law. Now, there's one little word you can use that explains, that expresses violation of the law. What is that little word? Sin. Now, you take away the law, there's no gospel. Because if there's no law, there's no what? There's no sin, then there's no need for a savior. There's no gospel. You take away the law, the gospel vanishes. The law and the gospel are like that. They're Siamese twins that cannot be separated. And if the law and the gospel are like that, Jesus is right between them. No law, no life. People always say the law can't save you. That's true. The law doesn't save you. The law was not made or given to save people. One of the functions of the law is to expose sin. Not just to expose sin, but to expose how sinful sin is. The purpose of the law convict the heart under the control of the Holy Spirit. But for a righteous person, the law is life. That's why the Bible says, the man that doeth them, he shall what? Live in them. But the problem is, no one can do them. Let me say it again. If you could keep God's law perfectly, that's life. But no human being can do that. That's why we need Christ. The law is life. Paul said in Romans 7.10, And that which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. The ten principles in God's commandments are life. When Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life, the only way you and I can have the life Christ is talking about is to have sin removed from our lives. Or expressed differently is to have violation of God's law removed from our lives. My brothers and sisters, there is a universal law. The laws that govern photosynthesis apply to plants, not to angels. The laws that govern gases apply to gases, not to angels. But the Ten Commandments of God apply to every angel and to every living being made in the image of God. Are you with me? Because it is those commandments that govern the behavior of intelligent beings. And all intelligent beings reflect the glory of God are required to do so. And the only way you reflect the glory of God is to live a life consistent with the standard of God. How do you know if a basketball player is the best player in the league? Hmm? His statistics, his rebounds, his shots, his free throws, is whatever they use to determine that unimportant stat. How do we know anyone occupies any position in any competitive area? There are statistics, there are figures. How is Miss World crowned Miss World? Where she answers the question better than the others, or she has more curves than somebody else, or she does something better than somebody else, and there's some artificial measuring system. She has more points, and so Miss Indonesia beats Miss USA. And she wins. Now, how does God determine that you and I are reflecting his image? The law of God. If there were no law to measure that, we could be living like Satan and no one would know. Listen to me carefully. 731. Where there is no law, there is no life. Let me go one step lower. Where there is no law, there is no existence. Satan is the God of death. Hebrews 2.14, 
For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. The devil has the power of death. Jesus Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life. The God of law, Jesus Christ. The God of lawlessness, Satan. Is God's law in your heart? If God shut down the laws that govern photosynthesis, we'd have very little to eat, if anything at all. Because at the bottom of every food chain is a form of plant life. Are you listening to me? At the, at the bottom of every food chain is a form of plant life. Let God shut down the photosynthesis process and the world will starve eventually. Then we'd appreciate law. But we're more than physical. We're more than solid. We're more than gas. We are moral beings. And the moral being has to behave according to a certain law. Just as the physical has to behave, the gaseous has to behave, and the solid, the liquid have to behave, the moral must also behave. And as the laws govern the physical or the solid, as the laws govern the gas, as the laws govern the liquid, the laws govern the moral and that law. The highest of all laws, God's commandments, because they are an expression of his very character. God's character is life and love. And so tonight I ask you, my friends, is God's law in your heart? Tomorrow night, the subject is heart to heart, which is also our theme. Now come tomorrow night, and I believe God will speak to you in a way he perhaps has not before. You will be enlightened. Come tomorrow night. The message is heart to heart. It will follow on last night's message. Tonight's message. You need to understand why I chose heart to heart. But for tonight, what's our subject? No law, no life. The very fact that you and I are living tonight tells us there's law. But there's a life higher than physical life, and that's the spiritual life that is also guided by law because everything that exists must be guided by law. And so there is a law. There is law. The enemy of God's law is Satan. And Satan tries every subtle and not so subtle means to to pull us away from God's law, to have us believe we can live our lives and do whatever we like, which appeals irresistibly to the carnal nature because sin is a principle that says do what you like. There are no restrictions. There are no guidelines. God says there are guidelines, there are restrictions because law is life. And so tonight, if the law of God is not in your heart, I ask you tonight, tell God, please, put your law in my heart. Not the law that governs solids, or the law that governs liquids, or the law that governs gases. That's not what you need in your heart. They're already functioning, there's nothing you can do, unless you commit suicide. <laughs> what you need is God's moral law to govern that behavior that either reflects him, reflects him, or disgraces him. And that is his law, his moral law, by which angels live, by which all intelligent created beings live, and by which we are required to live. That law, as we learned last night, which is the very foundation of his government in heaven and earth. Let me complete the quotation I read earlier, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 2. God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. He was made a subject of the divine government and there can be no government without law. And Jesus said, his father and he have a kingdom. A kingdom is a government. No law, no government. No law, no kingdom. No law, no life. How many of you will say, Lord, please, thank you for opening my eyes. 
put your law in my heart. Can I see your right hand? Stand up with me. Put your law in my heart. As you're standing, let me ask you a question very simple. Has any scientist ever recorded a change in the laws that govern photosynthesis? Hmm? No. Have the laws of electricity changed? Mm -mm. The laws that govern gases, they've been that way for as long as gases have existed. You throw something up, it comes down, the law of gravity. If that's the way it is universally, then it must also be that way morally. God's law that governs morality has never, ever changed. Because his character, on which it is based, does not change. But Satan, again, has deceived most of the world into believing that the moral law changed. Not by God, but by some human being. So the insult is double. One, that it changed, and two, it was changed by someone that's not God. But you're standing, and I'm standing to say, Father, put your law in our hearts. Why our hearts? Because everything comes from the heart. God does not judge the behavior first. He judges the heart. Christ's Object Lessons, page 316, paragraph 2, Ella White writes, Every act is judged by the motive. Motives come not from the elbow. They come from the heart. Child Guidance, page 201, paragraph 3, she continues, Every course of action has a twofold character and importance. It is either virtuous or vicious, right or wrong, according to the motives that prompt it. With God's law in our hearts, our motives will be right. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the simplicity of the word if we will read and study honestly. Dear God in heaven, forgive us for the many times we have disrespected your law. Not just your law, but a very concept of law. The many times we've allowed our carnal nature to drive us to think that we should do anything we like. But Father, we've understood tonight a little more clearly that all of creation, the entire cosmos, the universe, functions by law, solids, liquids, gases. And for those made in your image, there's a moral law to guide the moral behavior. And that law has not changed. Take away the law, dear God, and life vanishes. Take away the law, there is no existence. And so, Father, we thank you for this enlightenment and we pray that you would put into our hearts an ever-growing appreciation for law, law, dear God, life, law, law and gospel. Please, God, let us leave this place lovers of your law, which will make us lovers of you. Bring us back tomorrow night, I pray from my heart. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen. And amen. God bless you, my beloved friends. Come back tomorrow night when the subject will be what? Heart to heart.